four. Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You are listening to the most informational packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Fair. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. So glad you've taken time out of your day to join us in the program. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. Find the right size to fit your digging project. Visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day and allowing us to be part of it. To talk gardening for the next hour, whether you're listening through your radio or through one of the uh, simple radio apps or the tune-in apps on one of the 16 stations our show is broadcasted on throughout North America right here in 2020 or through a website, which is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com under the season four tab podcast replay or in studio video replay. We thank you for joining us. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend and gardening partner. Hi, Baird. There you go. This program is dedicated to you for you to help you grow a better garden. Have healthier trees, maintain your landscape and your yard, indoors and out, as well as preserving what you grow. There are several ways in which you can get a hold of us anytime. You can send us an email. Our email address is gardentalkradio at gmail.com. If you're on Twitter, you can send us a tweet, and we will tweet you back at TWVG Show, or just use hashtag TWVG. You can follow us on our Facebook page, The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, or you can jam your fingers in the phone anytime and give us a call 24-7 at 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-7469, or it's really easy. We got the numbers, so it would be easy for everybody to remember it, 1-800-927-SHOW. Well, we've got a big show lined up for you. Uh, we've got, in the first segment, we're going to be talking about what heirloom, organic, hybrid, F1, F2, and GMO seeds are. Then in the second segment, we'll discuss companion planting and how factual or how fiction it is. Learning. As well as uh, our guest this week, we have had several suggestions and several recommendations to have this gentleman on our program. He is the host of PBS's Growing a Greener World. Joe Lamp will be with us, and we'll get to as many of your garden questions as we can. So let's get into the program. Let's discuss what uh, what are what types of seeds here, hybrid, organic, F1, F2. What are those, and should we be concerned about them or not? Right. So heirloom, let's talk about heirloom first. Heirloom is an old cultivar cultivar of seed, and that's still maintained by gardeners, farmers, um, sometimes in isolated communities. These have been commonly grown throughout time. They are the original kind of seed that nature that started nature with. Nature started with. Um, there could be heirloom seeds that nobody else will ever have access to except for one particular family in one town or village or whatever. Native and American then, culture or, or a group. Um, right, or um, even like in Australia or the Aboriginals or what have you, um, you know, just maybe, or even just a family. Like this right. is my, like us, like, okay, right. this is the Baird family's whatever. We don't have a heirloom seed, but you don't know. Um, so, yeah, that's what heirloom is. Now, organic have been produced entirely through organic practices by certified organic operations. So, in the U.S. So, are these, can can organic be heirloom? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, in the U.S., it would be the USDA, uh, which is the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they, uh, they do the accreditation for the organic seeds, so that means that these were grown in organic conditions. Through a, a regiment of requirements in order to get certified. Organically. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and if a, if a farmer or a gardener who has attempted, uh, has filled out all this paperwork in order to have their seed certified, if they use a product that is not on that list of products in which could be used for an organic garden or farm for seed collection, then it's deemed inorganic. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so that is organic, 
And so you can easily save heirloom and organic seeds um, to to grow again year after year in your in your garden. Radishes, cool. leaf lettuces, tomatoes, the right. whole whole deal. Very the easy. The cool thing is that as you save those seeds, they become climatized to your specific location year after year. So they're going to be. Uh, I mean, not like if you give them to a friend to grow, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's perfectly fine. But they become more adapted. Like humans do in certain uh, climates. Right. Like you, for example, mm-hmm. move from the south to the north. And you, if your first few winters were rough and you still don't love winter, but you adapt a little bit better to the, the colder weather. So then, yeah. we, then we have hybrid seeds, which are not a genetically modifi- modification of seeds. It is the crossing of two parent plants to get a stronger offspring. Right. Yep, so it's a, um, this is done by a horticulturist or a botanist. So basically, say you have a drought-tolerant plant and a plant that is uh, prolific Produ- uh, yeah, pro- yeah. production, they could they could combine those two traits to make a hybrid plant. And there's nothing wrong with growing hybrids. Hybrids, uh, some hybrids are more disease-resistant than the organics and the heirlooms, and also they do produce it's based on the type some produce heavier than the heirloom or organic varieties and they are easier to grow in some cases and when people say well what would you recommend i'm a new gardener well hybrids would be a a good candidate for you uh the limit there are some limitations to the varieties that are available compared to heirloom uh, varieties let's talk about now if you saved a hybrid seed what would happen if you grow it next year? Uh, you're going to get, well, we'll pick a tomato here. If you, you save an early girl tomato, you're going to get an early girl tomato next year. However, it may not have the same characteristics that that plant that you saved the seeds from this year have. Um, so it, it, it will morph back, uh, the potential of morphing back into one of the parent plants or the characteristics of one of the parent plants. Right. Then, and then we have, we see this on some seed packets, F1. And F2 seeds. Right. This oh. is not a, a form of motorsports. Uh, the F1s are. Uh, but these, this is a classification of the type of seeds. Right. So um, these are a uh, hybrid seed. And they are known. So there's first generation, second generation. There can even be F3, which is the third generation. Those you still do not want to save. As it can morph back into one of those parent so plants. So I guess if you see that, you shouldn't be alarmed. It's just an, um, something that is common in, in regards to hybrid. Some of those are very easier, much easier to grow than the heirloom and the organic ones. Then let's touch on genetically modified seeds. Yeah, so genetic modif- genetically modified seeds, genetic modified, genetically modified organism, is something that was done in a lab to... Um, create a seed engineering methods to introduce a new trait to the plant which does not occur naturally in the species so um, you want to talk yeah, about corn yeah. the, this, this is very prevalent in big ag- agriculture and I know we've got a lot of farmers uh, across the country listening uh, especially in the Missouri and South Dakota areas and this, and this is what is used on big ag industries so we're going to let's take the, the, the corn seed here they take it into a lab and they alter the DNA structure of that seed to allow it to be to to absorb harm uh, to absorb chemicals that are sprayed on the field to kill weeds and grass and everything else um, in order to make the crop grow better because there's less competition if we kill all the weeds. Uh, so they're spraying harmful chemicals on all of the, the the crop and to kill all the vegetation and sometimes the wildlife inside of that field, uh, the microscopic and the worms and the, the grasshoppers and all that. So what it does is it absorbs all them chemicals, but it doesn't kill the corn because the DNA has been altered to absorb and not be, you know, it's, it's, met, it's changed the DNA structure so it can not be killed by that chemical or chemicals in which they spray on the field. Now, now people are concerned, you know, non-GMO, GMO. I hope I, I don't want to buy any GMO seeds for my garden. You're not going to be able to go no. to a seed company online, uh, Seed Savers Exchange, or fill in the blank seed company and purchase a pack of genetically modified soybeans or corn or tomatoes or peppers or whatever. 
because some of them are not GMOs. They haven't altered those uh, specific varieties yet. But because those are copyrighted seeds. When the big ag industry, uh, big farmers go and buy their seed stock, their soybeans or their corn or whatever they're growing, they have to sign a contract with the seed company stating that they will not save and, uh, these seeds because they're copyrighted and the, the company in which they bought it from can sue the farmer if they do save the seeds uh, because it's copyright infringement and all this other stuff. And you can do your own research on that. Um, but uh, you're not going to go and be able to purchase genetically modified seeds for your garden. So you don't have to worry about that at all. The, the reason why seed companies put uh, organic, heirloom, non-GMO, some of it is a, a marketing tool. Others is a calming, uh, a, a fear calmer because right. people are concerned of what they may be purchasing and where it may have come from or what it may be derived from and, and what and all of that stuff. So, yeah, so keep that in mind. Whenever you're purchasing seeds, heirloom organic, best there, uh, bet, bet we recommend those. Uh, hybrids, nothing's wrong with that. The F1s, F2s, F3s, totally safe, nothing wrong. And uh, the genetically modified uh, crops, uh, that's why a lot of things in the grocery store are labeled now non-GMO or, you know, they have the labeling on it, re- even though it's not required yet. Uh, it's, some of a, it's some of a marking tool. Um, so there, there you go on that. So that's just uh, understanding some of the seeds in which you are going to see labels on online and in your local independent garden center. Thank you for taking your time out of our day to listen to our show. This is our second show of 2020. Did you miss last week's show? We talked about what seeds to start, not to start indoors. We also talked about five things that do trip up a new gardener. And our guest was author and organic farmer, Atina uh, Differly. You can get that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast. Or we'll make it even easier to find them. Send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. And in the subject line, put past season, and we will send you the link. I guess you could put past show yeah. also. You, um, we, you could put show first show yeah, of 2020. Well, yeah, I yeah. missed your show, whatever. Yeah. We'll know. So it's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. And we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. We'll be, we'll be talking about companion planting. As great Is it as great as it's made out to be? You are listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, make the grass look greener, and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. We here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens understand that healthy soil is always the key to a successful garden. We know that chemical fertilizer burns carbon out of the soil and kills the micro life needed for a healthy soil ecosystem. No worries, Chicken Soup for the Soil by Dr. Jim's will stimulate life in the soil and supply all the nutrients most fertilizers neglect. Rather than force-feeding water-soluble chemical fertilizer, we suggest feeding the microbes a smorgasbord of 100% bioavailable nutrients that your plants can consume when they need them. Chicken Soup for the Soil is an amazing fertilizer that will increase the quality of all the fruits and vegetables you grow. Perfect for gardeners, growers, and farmers. To find out more about Chicken Soup for the Soil and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. Trim Bin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with a static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raised beds, RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. 
Do you tweet? Send Joey and Holly a tweet to at TWVG show or just use hashtag TWVG and they will tweet you back. Blue Mel's has been one of Milwaukee's premier garden centers for over 60 years. We have always been committed to putting our customers first. When there is demand, we stock it. When there is an idea, we grow it. When there's an opportunity, we build it. And when there is a need, we deliver. Our family continues to offer you the industry's best garden and landscape products and services. The same as my parents did when they first started the business back in 1955. Visit Blue Mel's. Quality and service are the roots of our business. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Spartan Mosquito, Dr. Jim's, Nasala Kabucha, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Thank you for hanging around through the break. We're going to be talking about companion planting. Is it real? Is it fake? Is there any truth to it? I got a little, little dance in here. Yeah, you got a little, you're jamming out of it. So let's, let, we're, let's go over what, what, because people think companion planting is great. You see these charts online and there's you know 47 charts and 38 different combinations that one chart says one thing and the other chart says nope that's not it you know what so well we're going to give them our resource yes here. yeah okay so you can find a lot of stuff online about all of it but yeah you can find a lot of stuff online about a lot of things it's not actually true <laughs> that's what abraham lincoln said yeah Com- so companion planting um we found this at garden myths dot com forward slash companion planting truth myth author is robert pav pavlis p p a v l i s so here's what the def- definition is for companion planting okay companion planting and gardening and agriculture is the planting of different crops in proximity for any number of different reasons including pest control pollination providing habitat for beneficial insects maximizing use of space to otherwise increase crop productivity so i guess here's the thing is that we 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 actually gave a talk about busting garden myths and right. we looked into companion planting. You could look at forty five different charts and one chart's gonna tell you to plant tomatoes next to basil. Another chart's gonna tell you to plant tomatoes. Keep, keep them apart. Keep them yeah, they don't like each other. Or peppers and blah blah blah, whatever. So there's no scientific evidence that anything works scientifically. Right. It's not. It's it. it, it, it there, no. There, no. Nothing's been tested in order to the, the reality of it is that. But, um, but I want to say yeah. that there might be something that works for you. So say for example, maybe you grow your basil next to your tomatoes because that helps keep the bugs away or. I mean, there there is the some there is some like there's a, the, like the pizza garden. But yeah, the, well, there there's, there's some truth to the companion planting, but it's there like you said there, and and, the, and this article speaks about it. Nothing has been tested right to, to prove that X Y Z works all the time. That's right. So I just you know don't want people to email us and be right. like, oh, I've been doing this for forty five years, whatever. So yeah, so just keep in mind that that's one thing is that there is no. There is no um, scientific proof. However, there is a term called polyculture, which is the growing of two plants next to one another that will help the uh, plants grow better. Like, uh, for instance, you can grow lettuce underneath the partial shade of a tomato plant. Uh, Lettuce is a cool season, short day plant, and you can grow it in that partial shade, which will allow that lettuce tricking the lettuce to thinking the days are not as long and not as hot Mm -hmm. so you're using two plants uh you can you can grow basil around zucchini 
to morph or trick the squash bug and the squash vine borer with the aroma of the basil or other herbs, and it confuses them, and they go elsewhere because they can't find any squash plant to devastate with their eggs or the larvae that they uh, burrow into the stem. Right. That is definitely um, a good point. And many examples... um, and what, the research, you know, there's there's no, I guess there's no reason for scientists, horticulturists, botanists to do this research because the money is is tight. Maybe they just don't feel the need to because there's different climates. There's di- like, you know, just all over the United States, there's different climates. And, and there's, there's no, different and nobody's good a, bugs, bad yeah. bugs. Yeah. So there's just too many variables. Now, maybe if you found some sort of article or proof for your area that would be different well like a local university extension yeah. maryland or iowa or you know illinois mm-hmm. in your region obviously if you're looking for information you want to go to that source uh you're if you're in tampa florida you don't want to look for resources in oregon or washington or, state or wisconsin right yeah uh, and and you read the definition but there that that's one definition there is multiple definitions so we came and agree on what a definition of this companion planting is so that puts up the first problem. If we can't agree on a definition, how can we agree on the terms and the conditions in which the method is practiced uh, in order to get the results? Now, many people will fall to the the uh, discussion of Native Americans, the Three Sister Garden. So that's technically not companion, pan- companion planting. That is basically um, in- not intensive planting. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's like... Well, they're, friendly plants. Well, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. You, they're, it's a form of polyculture, but there's three items involved in here instead of two. They're, yes, they're using the corn to grow the bean up it, and they're using the vegetation of the squash plant to, to be the ground cover. Ground cover. Now, yeah. many of you have heard that, oh, you plant the corn and you plant the bean next to the corn, and the bean emits nitrogen from the roots, which feed the corn. That's a garden myth. That's not true. Right. So there was a study, there's been many studies done that what are those um, nodules called on the root nodules yeah root nodules <clears throat> that those are like if you look at the roots of a bean plant any sort of legume plant like beans um, uh, peas what have clover. you clover clover that those nodules are going to um, re- release nitrogen into the soil this is not true there's no scientific evidence this has occurred that it happens there is uh, nitrogen in those, nitrogen yeah, in those, because they're, they have not, a, they're, they're pulling the nitrogen from the right, atmosphere. But the nitrogen does not travel Correct. from the root nodule to the corn roots across the soil, across the soil <laughs> to 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 fertilize the corn. So if you have low nitrogen in your soil, you want to grow corn, you're going to have to add some nitrogen. To and we soil. found that out many years ago. Yeah, we grew some beautiful corn, but we sure pumped, yeah. um, you know, a good healthy keeping. <laughs> Of nitrogen into our soil. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that that's one of the forms of companion planting. And yeah, you can see the charts. Tomatoes grow next to this. Don't grow next to that. Uh, so, it, it, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions about the term of companion planting. Now, there are some good plants, like we talked about with the zucchini and the basil and the tomatoes and the lettuce, that you plant one plant next to the other plant because it repels. Or, or or draws in beneficial insects or repels bad insects. Um, so just do not rely on the charts or any charts that you see on that. There are a lot of great articles by great gardenists and horticulturists and master gardeners that have decades of experience explaining in great detail why a certain particular practice of planting one plant next to the ne- uh, next to the other works however um keep that in mind that it doesn't always there's no science behind it well it's it's like the you know planting marigolds you know everybody says oh you plant marigolds in order to repel rabbits we've seen rabbits just come along and eat the marigolds down it depends on the variety of marigolds so it's not just the generic marigolds in which you buy um there's a a strain of marigolds which repels rabbits uh, but it, it's very difficult in order to find those, and um, I'm not familiar with the particular strain or variety in which those have in order to repel the rabbits. Uh, so if you're trying to repel rabbits, either use a firearm or use 
um, deer defeat or um, a, a, a fence in order to uh, put a barricade between them and the plants in which you are trying to grow. Because as we found out many years ago, plants grow a whole lot quicker and happier and healthier when they're not getting mowed down every evening by the herd of rabbits that move through the neighborhood. Right, for sure. Basically, there's tons of books out there. There's tons of charts. There's all sorts of stuff that you can find anywhere from the Internet to your library to the bookstore to a magazine, whatever. And there's no true scientific proof to any of this. Uh, I like this line here from this article. Most Most suggestions have no scientific basis. Many times it is just stuff made up to sell advertising, sell books, and promote individual ideals. Um, and that can be that can be true for a lot of things, not just companion planting uh, in our lives, but you know, <laughs> whenever it uh, comes to that. So companion planting, there are some benefits. Yes. Uh, is there science? No. And we've said that multiple times, but we want to make sure that you fully understand that just because you're looking at a chart from XYZ.com, we grow a garden, whatever, doesn't mean that it's there's any proof to it. Soon it will be warming up, and you want to make sure you can enjoy your yard without sharing it with beetles and grubs. With spring just around the corner, it start to time think, it's time to start thinking about those beetles and grubs in your garden or yard. There's all sorts of information about Japanese beetles, um, you know, and how they're going to be here soon. Grub gone is something that can help that. It can be applied to a turf or garden around ornamentals to control grubs and lessen the impact that beetles have on your yard this summer. Easy to use, apply with commercial spreader or an irrigate into the soil. You can find out more at phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. It can specifically target grub and beetle invaders without harming the beneficial insects such as bees, ladybugs, and butterflies. Again, phylumbioproducts.com, P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. And, um, uh, do not go anywhere. When we come back, uh, PBS's host of Growing a Greener World, Joel Lample, will be with us. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at PowerPlanter.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade gems and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. The Simply Solar Greenhouse is a one-piece molded fiberglass greenhouse that is easy to install and maintain. Multiple sizes available. Check them all out at migreenhouse.com. Oh, yeah. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala Kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Nasala Kombucha makes your body happy. Nasala Kombucha makes your body smile. 24-7-365. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com is your place for all things gardening, canning, radio shows, digital magazines, and more. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. 
The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Another growing season is just mere weeks away, and the place to go for all the Milwaukeeans to get all the garden supplies that they possibly could need is Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center. Blue Mills has over 40 varieties of bulk material. They have a knowledgeable staff, as well as they'll cater to your needs. If you don't want to cut grass, they have that service available to you. If you need delivery on your bulk material, they can do that for you. If you need landscaping done, they will help you get that done and get it done the way you want to do it, not the way they want you to have it done. Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, you can find them just off of Leighton at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield. You can give them a call anytime at 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. As one of the country's most recognized and trusted personalities in gardening and green living, that passion for living a greener life is evident to a nationwide audience who watches Joe Lample in his current role as the creator, executive producer, and host of the multi-award winning PBS series, Growing a Greener World. He is also an author, blogger, and more. Welcome to the program, Joe. Hey, Holly. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule, as uh, it always seems to be, uh, to join (laughs) Holly and myself and all of our listeners from across the country to enlighten us and them. Hmm. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, many people have trees in their yard on their property, and and they always think, you know, when can I trim them? Is it okay to trim now in early spring? Should I wait? Should I wait until fall? Should I have done it in fall? What, what's the best time to trim a tree, uh, whether it's fruit or non ornamental? Yeah, no. My recommendation is always to do it in late winter, early spring, before you have bud break or leaf break. So that you can see the structure of the tree, that's the best time that you can find those dead disease or crossing limbs or anything that you feel like is competing with another limb. And you're able to see the structure of the tree so that you can take out that limb that's less desirable than the other one. So it's the really only time of the year that you have that chance to really look into the skeleton to see how it's shaped. And then um, that creates the frame, the ideal framework with your, uh, you know, your hand in there to do some proper pruning to give it the best structure as possible. But having said that, the next best time to come in there is, you know, early summer to midsummer, because then even though it's filled out and you've maybe done some pruning in the early winter, now you see what it looks like with all the leaves out and how it, you know, you still may want to go in there and do a little more pruning to create greater air circulation or more light into the center of the canopy, at which point the summer is actually the best time to do it. The worst time, though, in my opinion, is to do it in fall or late fall as the tree is going into dormancy because, as you all know, pruning stimulates growth. So if you were to prune in the fall right before uh, the leaf goes dorm, the tree goes dormant and you make a cut, it may stimulate new growth, uh, like there may be a new surge of new growth that could be harmed when the cold weather comes on. So you want to avoid that, and all you have to do is wait a few more months until you're coming out of winter into spring and then go back in there and make that pruning then. Well, with that said, what is one of the more common mistakes that tree pruners do? Is it over pruning, under pruning, or is it really pruning at the wrong time or, or a combination of all? Well, um, I think it's... You know, pruning at the wrong time is never good, but um, it's. I think it's sometimes it's under pruning because you know pruning is actually good and healthy for the tree, and it creates that increased light and air circulation that 
without our help sometimes isn't going to happen. And it gives us an opportunity to get those crossing branches out of the way and introduce more um, openness into the canopy. Now, having said that, um, I have seen a lot of tragedy with pruning, and typically that is with topping where it's indiscriminate, uh, just taking a chainsaw and going straight across the top of a tree like a tabletop without any thought as to how the tree is growing and where you make the proper cut. They're just taking a tabletop approach and topping the tree. That is the biggest mistake. Indiscriminate topping of a tree without regard to the structure and how it grows, that's the worst thing. But in theory, what is the purpose of the tabletop trimming? Is it just convenience or uneducation or it's uneducation okay. it's lack of education it's, there's no horticultural basis for doing that whatsoever in fact it's discouraged by any arborist or horticulturalist that knows anything about tree care and proper pruning would would discourage tabletop tree topping um, and so it's lack of education and the people that do it play off the fear of the homeowners and the tree owners that have those trees and the basis of it is that the fear factor is that that branch, that big, those big branches are going to break off in the winter time and fall on their house. And so they succumb to that pitch and they go ahead and acquiesce and allow the tree to be table topped. And, um, it, it ruins the tree, Joey and Holly, and to the point that if it's done repetitively over the course of just a few years, that tree is going to die because what it wants to do is put out new growth as fast as possible to replace its engine to produce the photosynthetic energy it needs to grow. And having just lost its main branches, the only thing it can do is send out water sprouts, which are those rapidly growing vertical shoots that are poorly attached to the main stem. So if you think you've got a a problem of your branches falling off and under winter snow pressure and so forth now you've really made that problem worse because those new water sprouts that come out from the main branch those are the weakest attached branches on the entire tree the best branches were the ones that that guy came and cut off when he table topped it so it's a fear thing that's unwarranted and ill-advised okay that's definitely really good to know now we always talk about killer compost every time you come on the show but it's really Mm -hmm. worth repeating this is something that could happen to just about anybody what is killer compost and you had to deal with this personally in your raised beds could you share with us what happened okay so killer compost is basically using composted horse manure that came from uh hay that was grown in fields that was sprayed with persistent herbicide so i'm talking about grazon imidacloprid and different uh, persistent herbicides that are so, uh, they just don't break down naturally. In fact, they're designed not to break down. And so uh, over four or five years after composting, they're still intact. And that herbicide can kill any, not any, but many plants that come in contact with it. And so when gardeners unknowingly use horse manure, composted horse manure that happened to have hay that was treated with this persistent herbicide, that can pass through to the gardener's use of it in the garden soil, and that's when it can kill your plants and ruin your soil. And the reason I know about it is because I'm well-researched on it, but I also, even knowing that, I, I, I couldn't resist the temptation to use my own composted horse manure from my own farm and my own horses when I built my raised bed garden. And I put 20% of my bed, I used the composted horse manure on my property without checking first to see if it had the persistent herbicide in it. And it did. And as soon as I got the horse manure in my garden beds and the plants started growing and the roots came in contact with that persistent herbicide, suddenly my plants started curling up and becoming deformed and it was very apparent what had happened i knew immediately when i saw it what had happened and i did it to my own garden i couldn't believe it i was so mad at myself but you know live and learn it happens to the best of us and so you have to be careful with anytime you're using animal manure animal manure in your garden you have to be sure before you put it into your garden that it's free of any persistent herbicide. Well, this can be true for weed and feed, inorganic weed and feed that people take the grass clippings and compost and throw in their yard or in their garden because that weed and feed is to kill the broadleaf plants in the yard to make the grass grow, and it's persistent and when even in the compostable form. So it can be the same detrimental effect that uh, you went through uh, on a, on a much smaller level, but still 
as as deadly. It, it can be the same. The, the difference is that the the type of herbicide that's sold commercially for um, agricultural use, for example, for farmers that are growing out grass for hay harvesting, that herbicide is is less available in the consumer market and more for the commercial market, and that is the type of synthetic herbicide that is incredibly persistent, much more persistent than what you or I might purchase in a uh, garden center or a nursery, but the result can be definitely the same. The difference is the duration or persistence of the herbicide on the commercial level. Right. Well, as we get closer to planting each day, uh, many people, and, and, and I'm asking you this because you're an expert in this field, you've got raised beds, and the, the myth or the saying or the, the knowledge has been passed around that if you're growing in raised beds, you can plant these plants a whole lot closer than you could in traditional ground because you're growing them in really rich nutrient soil. Is there any truth to that, or is this just another garden myth that we've all been led to believe? I'd say it's a myth that, you know, you want good garden soil, whether it's in ground or in raised beds. The the raised bed environment is definitely an advantage for uh, being able to create the ideal soil mix for sure. You get better drainage and, and all these other better properties that you have more control over. But the plants still demand air and light, you know, air circulation and light opportunity. And so, you know, soil has nothing to do with that. The fact that you would be planting them closer together doesn't do anything that's good for that plant. They still want to have that air circulation and as much light as possible around them because they don't want to be crowded just because they're in a raised bed and they have better soil. That 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 does have some advantages over inferior soil, but there's no reason you can't have great soil in an in-ground bed either. But no matter where you plant your plants, you still need to give them good air and light circulation. Definitely. Now let's, um, as we, we try to start as many plants as we can from seed, but we do pick up plants mm-hmm. from the independent garden center and there's nothing wrong with that. What are a few right. tips you can share when it comes to picking out those plants from your local garden center? Well, first of all, you want to, uh, I, I do this all the time. Um, I, I pull the plant out of the container and, you know, a garden center owner or somebody that works at a garden center that knows their salt, it's going to know that you are obviously a, an astute gardener. If you're checking the root mass or the root system, you're looking for healthy roots and healthy roots look white or fresh. They don't stink. Uh, they're not brown and kind of rotty. And that's the first thing that I do. And of course, I'm certainly looking at the above ground growth, anything that has any signs of disease. And then I rub my hand over the top of it. And in case there's any white fly or some sort of pest flying out of the top of it upon disturbance, that's not a good indication because you don't want to take those plants and bring them home and introduce them into your garden and bring in those pests or those eggs that may exist on the plant that you bring into the garden that was wasn't even in your original garden until you brought it in so um those are the main things i'm trying to avoid bringing or introducing in pests and diseases or plants that are uh, root bound and overcrowded inside of their container some good advice there, Joe. Uh, let's talk about the, the program that has made you well known, uh, throughout, not over, not, not only North America, but around the world. Uh, you're, yeah. you're in the 10th season of PBS's Growing a Greener World. And in those 10 seasons, you've met a lot of people and gone a lot of places. Uh, is there a couple of moments or people or events that you have, uh, witnessed or been in, introduced to that really stands out in your mind as, as a really, uh, uh, one of the things that's going to stick with you forever? I'll give you three quick ones. Um, the first one was the one we won our Emmy on. It's Stephen Ritz with the Green Bronx Machine in the Bronx, New York. He's a school teacher. Now he's a volunteer school teacher, and he introduced his his children, his students who lived in uh, who live in uh, public housing across the street from the school, and they're um, they're overweight, they're undernourished, their grades were uh, terrible, their attendance was terrible, their attitudes were terrible. And Stephen Ritz, uh, as a dedicated teacher, wanted to solve that problem. And he felt like the best way he could do that was to teach them about gardening and eating healthy. So he started growing food inside the classrooms and in the schoolyard garden and taught the kids 
not only how to grow that food, but what to do with it once they harvested it. So they started creating salads and learning recipes and making those dishes inside the school classroom. And they had so much left over that they could take it to the school cafeteria and share it with the other students and then send it home. And they could take it to their parents at the end of the day, and they would cook at night with this produce that the kids had made in school. So the the long the short story to that is that the grades went up, the weight went down, the attendance went up, everything that you would want to improve upon happened through connecting these kids to the miracle of growing food and eating a more healthy diet. So that's the first one. The second one was Jason Brown. He's an ex former NFL football player who was this, uh, the highest paid center in the league at the time at 29 year old, 29 years old he had a 35 million dollar contract for the NFL that he walked away from with his seven kids to start a farm in North Carolina outside of Raleigh North Carolina and he named his farm first fruits farm He'd never farmed before, but he was so used to learning how to do things through YouTube. As a pro football player, you learn how to scout your team by watching video. So he figured he could learn to be a farmer by watching video, which is what he did. But here's the neat thing about it. Nine years in now, he's grown about a million pounds of produce, and he's donated every pound of it to his community, not only the first fruits, but everything that he's grown and harvested has been donated. So this is a guy with a really incredible heart, and he walked away in faith to start this farm with this very, very lucrative career. And then the last one is just kind of a personal hero for me, Margaret Roach, who lives outside of uh, New York City, about a mile, hour and a half north. And she, ha- she gardens on two and a half acres. She's an organic gardener. She's just kind of the poster child for who I would consider a uh, growing a greener world um, icon. She is sensitive to the environment. She loves nature. She understands biodiversity and creating healthy habitats. And um, everything she does, she gardens to improve her natural surroundings and to benefit wildlife. And in the process, she creates the most beautiful gardens that you've practically ever seen. And she's just she's just got a heart for teaching, too. So not only does she do this for herself, but she does it more to educate the public through her podcast, um, A Way to Garden, and through her website, and through just all her access that she provides she's very accessible she actually ran worked for martha stewart for 25 years and ran her website and her gardening columns and very many aspects of martha stewart's um empire is attributable to margaret roach's influence over 25 years of working with her but about um 10 or 12 or 15 years ago uh margaret retired and moved up to her little a farmhouse in upstate New York to garden full time and to become a full time garden writer. And she's got some great books and a great website. And she just, she's a dear friend, but she's a great role model for gardening, especially organic gardening. Those are some definitely great, some great wow moments. Now, where can people find more about you and your show if they don't already know? Yeah, joegardener.com is the very best place to go to to get uh, access to our our YouTube channel, Joe Gardner TV, and our television show, Growing a Greener World. But that website is growingagreenerworld.com. That's the name of the show, and then it's just .com after that. But, you know, we've got online courses at Joe Gardner, and we've got lots of educational opportunities in the podcast. The Joe Gardner Show podcast is there at joegardner.com slash podcast. And so those are the main hubs, Holly and um if you Google my name or or Joe Gardner, you're going to find me as well as all the different ways that you can access the information. Well, Joe, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day and sharing your wisdom with us and some of the stories that have made Growing a Greener World what it is today. Thanks, Joey and Holly. I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. And when we come back, we're going to answer your garden questions. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. 
brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit IvyOrganics.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at DripWorks.com. Seed Savers Exchange has been saving, preserving, and sharing heirloom seeds since 1975 and today continues to provide those seeds to gardeners just like you. With 600 plus varieties offered in this year's catalog and 18,000 listings on their exchange, their gardener to gardener seed swap, Seed Savers Exchange is keeping cherished seed varieties alive. Visit SeedSavers.org to request a free catalog or to purchase seeds online for this year's growing season. That's SeedSavers.org. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. We've got a bunch of your garden questions that we are going to answer. If you've got a question, you can submit it at GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. You can give us a call anytime, 24-7 at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. And we will get the question answered for your particular gardening problem. Let's start with this one, Holly. We're starting seeds indoors. And a question came in and said, I noticed fru- uh, these flies flying around the, uh, in the air coming out of the soil. What are they? Should I be concerned? How do I deal with it? Yeah, so those are fungus gnats or, yeah, that's basically what they are. And it's very normal. They they live in the soil. Their eggs live in the soil. You're potting soil. So you can sprinkle cinnamon over the soil, um, just regular household cinnamon, you can get the cheap stuff, just a dusting, and this has antifungal properties, and it help keep those gnats away. Um, so that is what you can do. Also, if you already have the gnats, you can take a shallow dish, put a few drops of dish soap in it, so like a little saucer or something like that, a few drops of dish soap, and then you want to add the rest with some apple cider vinegar. Mix that up, and those gnats will find their way into it. Uh, works very well. Uh, here's a question here. Uh, zone, they're in zone 4A. When is a good time to start seeds? When is the right time to uncover my berry, buried rose bushes and prune established lilacs, climbing roses and fruit trees? So there's a lot of information here. Uh, so when it comes to seed starting in any zone, you want to base it on your last average frost date. You can go to your favorite search engine and type in, uh, last average frost date. Insert your zip code, and it will pull up uh, uh, the map and give you a, um, an indication of when that uh, time occurs. Now, that doesn't mean if May 1st is your last average frost date, you can plant stuff May 2nd. We covered this last week on the program. This is the guideline. So it still holds true 
uh, 12 weeks for leeks, uh, 12 weeks before your last average frost date for leeks and onions, peppers, uh, celery in that range, tomatoes, eight weeks, brassica, six weeks, uh, that type of thing. So keep that in mind. Uh, when it comes to when to uncover your buried rose bush, uh, what was the reason why you covered it for the first, or buried it for the first reason? To keep it from freezing, to keep it, you know, alive. So you want to wait until all danger of frost and freeze is over, then you can un, uh, you can dig it out. Uh, pruning lilacs, you want to do that in early spring before the buds open up, uh, or you want to wait until fall uh, for the flowers. Now, you want to be aware that you don't want to prune too much because some of the, the buds, uh, if you prune too much, the buds will be taken off. That was going to be the flowers uh, for this year, so keep that in mind. Uh, we, we've got several lilac bushes uh, in uh, in, in the big garden and at your sister's backyard. Mm-hmm. I don't think they've ever been pruned once um, as long as I can. Uh, no. No. So you don't necessarily have to prune them. You prune them for control uh, more than anything. And when it comes to pruning your fruit trees and your uh, climbing rows, uh, the time to prune is autumn through winter while they are in dormancy stage. Uh, for fruit trees, early spring before the buds appear, uh, like, and then also you can prune it in the fall uh, as long as it's still in dormancy. Uh, it's a good time to prune to get rid of some of those excess limbs. And by pruning a fruit tree, you may think you're damaging the tree by taking out a limb that produced a lot of pears or apples or whatever the case is. However, you're reducing the amount of fruit that's on that tree, but you're increasing the volume of that individual pieces of fruit Instead of having small fruit, you will have larger fruit because you're pruning it back and the tree has more energy to build up those fruits uh, on the tree. So that's, that's something to be aware of. Uh, another question here, is it best to germinate your seeds before planting, soaking them, or is it okay to just put them in the ground and let and water them and, and let them germinate that way? Well, you don't have to soak your seeds. Um, you just want to keep your soil moist and they will do just fine. We do soak larger seeds such as peas, beans, corn. Um, it is easier to handle the time based on the size of the seeds. Small seeds, um, you can soak anywhere from 15 minutes to peas, two to three hours. Some people soak their seeds overnight. It's kind of up to you. Larger um, seeds larger are seeds. much easier. Yeah. Um, it, as far as, I, I don't know if you're asking if you can just... Um, there there are people who soak all their seeds in a paper towel method in right. a bag or and then transplant them. Like seed tape, homemade seed tape. But, and also, you don't have to start your seeds either. You can throw most of them, direct sow them, just depending on what you're, what you're doing. Um, so here's another one is number, uh, yep. so, uh, would you grow strawberries or blueberries in containers? Uh, many gardeners do do this and have a great crop. However, strawberries put off, the since they're perennial, um, strawberries... Put off those runners, which are daughter plants. So what they do is they shoot on the off. June bearing. Yeah, on the June bearing. If they're ever bearing, they don't do this, but the June bearing do. So it'd be important to know because if you grow them in a container, they start shooting off those runners. You have to have a place for them to go, or be aware that this is going on. However, you're planting a perennial plant, uh, a strawberry, that takes you know that will grow for five to seven years, and you're putting it in a container, and you've got to keep it alive for essentially 26, 28 weeks a year, and it goes into dormancy over winter, um, for a couple of weeks of berries. And sometimes it's not, you know, abundance of berries. So my suggestion would be avoid putting strawberries in containers, either establish it in a ground garden or just go to your pick-your-own-farm. Now, on the other side of that, with the blueberry in containers... They have, they need a, a lower... Acid soil? Uh, uh, more, acid, yeah, more acidity. Acidity. Yeah. yeah. Lower pH, um, so about four and a half, uh, four, four and a half. So I would recommend doing that in a container. But you would want to make sure you do that, you do that lower pH soil in that container, not just taking, um, whatever soil you may have. Because your plant will die. Your plant, oh, yes, it will. Your, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It will die. It will die. So <laughs> that's something to definitely keep in mind. Um, so Sherry asks if my potatoes have sprouted from last year, but they're all small. Will I still get good sized potatoes this year? Yeah, it's hard to say. It's based on the variety of the seed potato. Uh, recommended if you're going to plant seed potatoes in which you saved from last year or any seed potato, uh, whether you get it from Wood Prairie Farms or you get it from your organic gardening center uh, or or food uh, or grocery store, you want the minimum size to be a chicken egg is the the smallest you really want to plant. That will ensure 
ensure you to have enough energy in that sprout in order to grow a plant, as well as have a good offshoot of tubers. Uh, the smaller the potato, realistically, the smaller the, the harvest is going to be in, in girth and uh, size of that potato. So you want to you want to avoid it. Just eat those. Snap the, the eyes off of them. Go ahead and eat them, bake them, and get some decent size seed potatoes in order to have good success uh, and make it worth the effort in order to grow them. Uh, Sean asked, how many pole beans can I put in a five-gallon bucket with a trellis attached to it? Well, that would be one. Because it's about one square foot, right? Or well, it, it's nine beans per. Oh, it's what, nine if, beans. A, 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 a five-gallon bucket is approximately one square foot. So you, with a pole, with with bush beans, you can get nine in there. With pole beans, you can only get eight in a five-gallon bucket with a trellis. And you're going to add good nutrient soil in that bucket. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, be sure you have drainage holes uh, in anything that you do. And you don't want to just put the drainage holes in the bottom. You want to put them around. The, the bottom of the sides, too. About an inch up, uh, leave the bottom alone, about an inch up the side of the bucket to allow a little wa- water reservoir to a, establish in the bucket. Um, has anybody, have you, uh, used coffee grounds as mulch around tomato plants? Listen to a couple of podcasts, and they are talking about that it's good to put around your tomatoes. Uh, however, um, that is not a good suggestion or advice to be given because uh, a couple of things you put too much coffee grounds around the base and yeah and uh, it creates a thick layer of imp- uh, 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 that water can't permeate through uh, it creates a big thick mulch and big mess you can incorporate the coffee grounds in the soil yeah it's a great food for worms and it helps build up the organic matter in your garden um, and you can just go ahead and mix them in, and even with the the filters, as well. So, and if you have if you drink a tea, you can do tea grounds. Right. Um, not the same, not the same benefits, but still beneficial to your soil and will feed the worms. Well, we are out of time. We time. We greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. Miss any portion of this show or want to revisit it in its entirety? You can do that by going to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com and clicking on the Radio Season Four tab at the top of the page, or you want to send uh, you 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 can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail dot com, and we will send you the podcast link for this program as well as the in-studio video link. Uh, you can check out past shows by going to uh, your favorite podcast platform and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast. We always appreciate you telling your garden friends about the program. That is how we sh- get noticed, how the word spreads. Join us next week on the program. We'll be talking about how does fertilizer work and when to apply. It seems simple, but there's a lot of science behind fertilizer, fertilizers, and when to apply and how it breaks down and if it breaks down in the soil, as well as deer-resistant plants that you will want to add to your landscape. And our guest will be author of several books. Her most recent one is No Waste Kitchen Garden. Kate Peters will be with us. We will also answer all of the garden questions that we can squeeze in during the hour. Until next week, same time, same station. Uh, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs>